Joining us today on a special edition of Superheroes of Science, we're pleased to welcome Lindsay Purcell. Lindsay is an urban forestry specialist with the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources here at Purdue University. So thank you so much, Lindsay. We appreciate you taking time and, and come out recording and helping us understand a little bit more about invasive species, yeah. especially Bradford pears, yes. which we happen to be in a, I don't know, an orchard of Bradford. <laughs> yeah, we've got quite a thing in here of invasive species. Great, great learning laboratory here that's living for us. So uh, you, for your job, uh, it's you deal with this uh, for like part of a living, right? Yeah, invasive species have, uh, were once good plants that got a bad rap. Um, a lot of our landscape plants that you see in your neighborhoods are invasive species. Common things like Bradford pear, Chanticleer pear, Cleveland pears, barberries, uh, euonymus or uh, what we call uh, euonymus or winter creeper, ground cover. Those are all invasives, but they were once introduced landscape plants that perform very well. That's why they become so wildly popular. Uh, but Unfortunately, once they're taken out of their natural habitat and introduced into our, our habitat or our landscapes, then we don't know what's going to happen with them. And as a result, they become invasive oftentimes because of their profuse and proliferation of, of seed leaves that uh, cause issues for us. Okay. Now, the Brad Prepare in particular, it's, it, yes. this, uh, you, we were talking before, and you kind of told us a little history about that, yeah. which was definitely educational for me. Yeah, the Brad Prepare was such a wildly popular tree because of its um, wonderful flowering. I mean, there's no, nothing rivals the Brad Prepare um, with flowering, except that it smells awful. <laughs> 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 you don't even like that. Um, but what happened was Bradford pear was the first introduced um, cultivar of the ornamental pear, but it had a very weak branching habit. So they modified the genetics and tried to create a more stable structure, and that's when we have had the new cultivars like Santa Clara, Cleveland Select, and a couple of others. But what happens is the Bradford pears that were here and those introduced cultivars cross-pollinated, and that's when they reverted back to their original state, the ornamental pear, that creates a huge amount of seeds. Now the original uh, cultivars, Bradford and Cleveland Select and those others I mentioned, didn't, didn't seed so much, but they didn't know what was going to happen when they got back together again. <laughs> oh. So it sounds like it has something to do with, a little bit with the genetics of the yeah, plants. And it's all about the genetics and they some, some will cross-pollinate with others, but not all of them, okay. but the ones that do create what we have with this invasive pear. And you can see there's a lot of seeds on them. Um, they're still producing a lot of flowers, but as a result of flowers, we have seeds there. Yes. And so they self-plant themselves, or um, our best tree planters that we have naturally are birds. Mm -hmm. They digest those and deposit the seeds everywhere, as you can see. Yeah. As a result, we have this wicked, uh, not just Bradford or ornamental pears, but also Asian bush honeysuckle. And we, and we look at this and we think, man, this is really cool. This is a nice natural area, but we yes. know there's some inherent problems with that. Oh, we know uh, a lot of people have thought these were specifically planted, and that's just not the case right here. No, we often take credit for this natural area, but nature did this for us, but unintentionally. And it seems like a good thing, but the problem is it, it crowds out um, space for natural um uh, natural species, our wildflowers, and more favorable, sustainable trees and shrubs and understory plants that are uh, better for our environment and less invasive. Yeah, and that's why we picked this spot right. uh, for the for the interview this time because it's we were in an area that people had told us, "Oh, that's so pretty over there." <laughs> when you drive by early in the spring, it is just the, the Bradford pears are all blooming. It's white. It is very attractive looking aesthetically, yeah. Yeah. not really realizing that no this was not we did not the uh, people did not plant this this is all succession and they're out competing in a huge way any native plants whatsoever yeah I, I, you'd be hard pressed to find any native trees in here um, maybe a, a few but by and large i mean 95 percent of this area is is two two species of plants and that's asian honeysuckle and the ornamental pear 
and when we look at the side of the interstate, this is this is exactly what we seem to see. Yeah. And they, they're why do they outcompete the native things so well? Yeah. Well, you know, trees have um, they don't get to be the largest, oldest living organism on the planet without having some really good, cool strategies for survival. And it's a lot about allocation of their resources. They'll either outgrow their competitors or they'll defend against them. Now, like Asian bush honeysuckle, it has a little pathic uh, qualities. And little pathic means it puts out a poison in the soil that will prevent plants from growing under it. Now, these guys, they just outgrow their competition, which shades the environment around them, which doesn't allow germination of live or more favorable trees. Okay. And I, I know with trees, we, we just love trees, and especially, I think, for air quality, trees are so important. So, I would wonder, well, but it's a tree. Is it that helpful? Yeah, you know, I, I have mixed feelings about that, you know. And one of the things is, and especially we live in Indiana, and we rank 46 out of the 50 states in air and water quality, and trees are the best biological machine for um, ecosystem services and functional benefits like cleaning our air, removing carbon, uh, stormwater filtration, all of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so these do help, but the problem is, is these are not long-term sustainable plants. Oh. They'll just grow for 20 20- 20 years or 25 years, then they'll split apart or they'll die. These are very susceptible to disease issues like uh, uh, bacteria, leaf blights, things like that. And as a result, they just die back and then we're left with nothing. I see. Oh. As compared to like, a native, like a, like a, a hardwood, a forest, or a regular one. Or a maple, they're here for 100, 200, maybe 300 years. Wow. So it's just a short term thing. And also, once we want to do something with this, the getting rid of these isn't so easy because they have a lot of storage organs underneath in their roots and they have a lot of energy there. So if we would cut that off, I think it just makes them mad and they go back even stronger. They just push up new energy and new new growth. And yeah. I know with the Asian honeysuckle, we had one volunteer in our yard and it seemed like six years later they're still part of that thing around. Oh yeah, I mean it takes a lot of it takes a lot of maintenance inputs and also the bad thing about this is when we're ready to maybe create a more sustainable forest here or, or even a landscape, even if we cut it down, we have to treat it with a lot of chemicals, which is hard on our environment as well. So long term, it's not a good thing. Short term, it may seem fine and rather innocuous, but it's not a sustainable plant or a situation for, for these open areas like we have here. Well, I'm almost afraid to ask, but... Uh a lot of these have been used in landscaping yeah. and a lot are around uh-huh. and so what can we do to make sure that we're not propagating this invasive species that we might have on our property well industry professionals have recognized this is a, a, a problem a, a growing problem literally <laughs> and we've done a couple of things here one we've in, introduced the, the uh, indiana terrestrial plant rule which outlaws basically planting of certain plants now this guy isn't on here yet because it's still a major part of the nursery trade. So there's a little bit of a conflict there, but I think it's on the um, uh, the not recommended list, and we're kind of moving it up. Now, like Asian bush honeysuckle, it's on that list, so you can't plant it. Okay. Um, now in Lafayette, uh, they they've initiated a new program where if you cut down your ornamental pear. Uh, they will give you a new tree and plant it for you. Oh wow! So we're, communities are adopting that kind of um, that kind of uh, measure to try to reduce it because every one of these will produce two to five thousand seeds. Oh, and so that's a lot of plants. And if you get rid of that, then that's perhaps two to five thousand less trees we're going to see invading our natural area. And that's per growing season, correct? Per that's season. <laughs> right. And I'm looking. I'm seeing literally thousands of them yes. right here. Yeah. And so I mean, holy moly, that's a lot of. Well, and I've also had people say, but it's a lot of nice uh, food for our wildlife and our birds and things, and things but. This research has shown that this isn't really a good food product for birds because it's high sugar um, and less uh, nutritious for them in the long run as well. I see. Oh. So that's, yeah, I see some negative benefits then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I see, you know, 
the invasive short term, they don't seem like a problem, but, mm -hmm. you know, and even if you walk out into the woods and you see these, or you'll see the red barberries or the winter creeper you want them, so you're like, how did that get there? Mm -hmm. Was there an old house here or something? Yeah. Like, no, that's just deposited by birds. Okay. And it shouldn't be there. And then you will not see your natural wildfires like you normally see, like trillium, jack in the pulpit, Dutchman's breaches, all those things that we like to see that are natural part of our forest floor as a result of that. It's, it's really hard sometimes for all of us, including myself, to look past what is now. Yeah. And so to looking into the future. It's like when I had the volunteer, the Asian honeysuckles pop up in my yard. My wife and I like, oh, that is so pretty. And look, the bees love it. And oh, we, we should let this grow because that's just better for our ecosystem and all of our yard. And it's so pretty. And it kept growing and growing and growing. And uh, it's like, oh, yeah, it's we need to trim this back. And someone's like, do you know what that is? Yeah. I'm like, it's pretty. And they're like, no, uh, it, it, it's bad. And it's, you're going to have problems down the road. And so we started looking at it and researching. And it, it's really hard to, okay, okay, we're going to get rid of this. We're going to cut this down. Yeah, it, it's truly a conundrum. I mean, I can see, you know, I used to have a more hardcore stance on these. But, you know, is it is it better than nothing? You know, that's the, that's the struggle that we have. And perhaps it is on a very short-term basis, but... You see, it's gotten to the age now where it's producing a lot of seeds. Yes. So now it's past that tipping point of really being helpful. Now see. it's becoming harmful. So we got to look at that long term and think about you know planting these areas that are more responsible environmentally and more sustainable. Now, and it's for me, I'm thinking, all right, the average person doesn't know what that is. Okay, mm -hmm. there's my neighbor had a Bradford pear, and it it, it uh, split apart. I mean, heck, earlier this yep. year, my social yep. media feed was full because uh -huh. we had that really late snow, no, and, it, and it, everybody's it. Bradford pears were breaking. Yeah, and I was thinking, oh, that's awesome, <laughs> and uh, they're thinking, oh, what a tragedy. But they don't know. People don't know. We we've not been trained right. to know what to do, what to replace them with. I know you've told me before. It's like you're like oh, the best thing to do for your brat prepare is to cut it down yeah. right and uh coming from a tree hugger like yourself that says a lot i am an official <laughs> tree hugger I, I say if you don't like the the, the act or the thought of, of removal or cutting a tree down then i just call it aggressive pruning what pruning at a ground level <laughs> Well, I, well, and I love the resource that you I know it's great. And that you said that some communities, like, like our community now, that we can cut it down, they'll come in and bring you a tree and plant it for you. But before we, what is, are there other resources that we could do before we ever get to that point? Yeah, so. if you want to know more about it, one of the mm -hmm. best, it uh, still seems like kept secrets in Indiana is the Purdue Education Store. And we have lots of videos and resources about trees invasives alternatives to invasives is a great resource to, to show you what trees are better than this if you're going to select one there's a lot better trees and actually there's some that look a lot like this that that perform very much better in the landscape uh, that's a good resource and then also uh, there's a website called treesaregood.org and you can get a list of certified arborists in your area uh, that can help you select a plant and also determine what to do with your tree you know, you look at the tree, I've, I've driven by lots of homes where this is the only tree in their front yard. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, yes. Are you going to tell me to cut that down? Right. You know, that's that takes some good salesmanship or, or some good research to support that mm -hmm. decision. And it's sometimes a challenge, you know. It's, again, like I said, it's maybe... Oh. It's part of, it's hard, but it's part of environmental stewardship. It is. Yeah. Taking care of the environment, it's more than just recycling our plastics. Yeah. It's actually sometimes action, and sometimes action we'd prefer not to do. But it, you had mentioned the uh, alternatives to invasive species. Right. Last time we talked, I went and looked that up. So I'm like, I am curious, because I'm redoing my front yard now. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, I'm curious to know. And now that confused me a little, because it was listed. Uh, I, when I first saw that, oh, this isn't for... Uh, a homeowner they said however it was listed uh, for like nurseries oh, nursery and, growers yeah it was for nursery growers or something but I thought, oh that's in it at first then I opened it up I oh yeah this yeah. tells me all the trees and stuff yeah. and even by height and so what area to put it in and the reason that we wrote that in that uh, perspective is the reason we wrote that in that perspective is the fact that 
what you buy is basically simple economics of supply and demand. Yes. And we're trying to convince nursery growers that we don't want these anymore. Is there anything else we could plant to replace this? And still, you can have a good sales or have good sales and you know a good business. Well, but at some level, though, there's got to be that communication with the suppliers where the homeowners are going and getting their their. Yes. It's never going to completely go away until well, if you go to a reputable nursery that's oh. dedicated to plants. Yes. Okay. You're going to find the best species for your landscape. That's good. And typically, they won't have invasive species. Now, there may be there may be some there, and I they still. They have a high demand for them, so they do carry some, but they're getting further and further away from that. It's taken some time, but it is getting there. You know, the in our green industry is very environmentally sensitive and responsible, but um, it, it takes some time. Yeah. It's very, I'm hoping people people also take action. You know, it, it, yeah. I, you know, it, help educate your neighbor, let them know. The, and uh, you know, help them maybe plant a tree. Maybe maybe mm -hmm. you have an elderly person around, and that's the one tree in their yard. I'm thinking down the road for me, exactly what right, it was. Right. And so maybe go in and help them and talk to them, like, hey, these are really kind of bad for the environment, you know. And so to help the bigger the environment, mm -hmm. could we replace that maybe and help them out? And like like I said, there are uh, the, the education store. You have the alternative races. I looked at that one. Yeah. We can talk to arborists, and don't be afraid to let. Any place that sells plants, no. If you see that, if you're at well, a big box store, let them know that this is really bad for our environment. We would rather you did not sell that. If you want to continue getting our money, you might consider that. Yeah, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources have nursery inspectors. And they go around the state of Indiana, and if they find invasives in those nurseries, they'll tag them and say, do not sell. You have to destroy those. So the state's taking an active role in preventing invasives from spreading. Now, we're just talking about terrestrial plants. I mean, there's invasives in every part of our environment, yes. in the water, in the air. I mean, there's all, you know, we have invasive fish. Um, we, have, we have mammals that actually can be invasive as well in certain ways. But, uh, you know, invasives are a major economic problem mm. and it's significant to all of us. So we got to watch what we're planting and be, make more informed decisions. And, you know, again, talking uh, to Purdue Extension Specialist and Purdue Extension Resources is the best way to do that. Perfect. Yeah. I like that. I and that's good advice. And I think, like you said, we just have to make informed decisions and we need to educate ourselves before because it's... I mean, we want everything that's best for the environment. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we need to think about long term. You know, planting trees is, you know, a good thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, selection is the biggest part of that that's often overlooked. We'll see, oh, that's pretty. I'll plant that. No, yes. It may be this. Yeah. It may not be responsible. So I always say, you know, plant trees for the future. Plant, I, I don't like that anymore. I like plant trees with the future. One that's oh, I love sustainable that. and long term and right. helpful to our environment rather than harmful. Oh, I like that. I just love, I mean, and just bringing back to the beginning of the conversation that, yeah, that they're good. It's, it is a tree for a short term right. compared to a tree like an oak or a maple that's going to last maybe potentially hundreds of years. Right. And that just makes sense. We want to think about, you know, our children, children's children. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, yes. Everybody loves big old trees. Yeah. But we're having, we're, we see fewer and fewer of them because of development, agriculture, mm -hmm. and you know, growing population has growing demands on our natural resources. We got to be very careful about our selections and make sure they're the right tree for the right place for the long term haul. And it it feels good to have those old trees. Oh, yeah. it feels, I know we have sycamores in our front yard that I mean, my grandfather put in. Yeah, you know, it's I've driven uh, hundreds of miles. I mean, I, I get calls and emails all the time. I've got the oldest tree in Benton County. i got the oldest tree. I'm like, uh, it's got to be 500 years old. Yeah. Probably not more than maybe 250. Oh, wait. You, you, we have trees that are 500 years old? I've got one that I know of. The oldest that I know of is is uh, south uh, between in Tippecanoe and Montgomery County area. And we think it's about 300 years old. Yeah. That's about the oldest because wow. back in the early 1800s, um, about 80 percent of Indiana was forested. Yeah. Now it's flipped up. About only 19 percent is forested. 
Um, in fact, uh, Mary Jackson, who's a, a, a geographer for the state of Indiana, he said a squirrel could go from state line to state line without ever touching the ground. But we were removing trees at the rate of 100 acres per hour by axe and saw back in the mid 1800s for agriculture. Oh, just for to make agricultural land? Just to plant, yeah, really. Okay. And so okay. we lost a majority of our, our it, trees. It seems like that, that era we did a lot to destroy. Uh, in, in the name of agriculture, then it's yeah. the wetlands we have from North, used to have in northern Indiana was just absolutely massive and world renowned. If you're fascinated with that, read the Mary Jackson's book, Natural History of Indiana. Oh. That's about two poplars that are eight feet across. Was normal. Oh my gosh! I mean, it's just amazing what we had at one time. Yeah, and it's just stunning. You know, I mean, you don't really see that except in Europe now. I mean, they appreciate their better trees a lot more than we do. A lot of it has to do with risk associated with trees. We're very sens oversensitized to risk and what trees present, um, and also aesthetics. Sometimes, as you get older, they get a little uglier, you know, maybe not perfect <laughs> form, and so we're like, yeah, put that down and paint something prettier. But we've lost, you know, a, a witness tree or something that mm -hmm. is historical. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank you for taking time to talk to us and coming out here and in our invasive species area that everyone thinks has been uh, cultivated. And this is, you know, if, if you're ever walking or driving on this path, this is a living laboratory of what invasives can do. There's several here, you know, ground cover. We've got crown bats. We've got, um, as far as the understory, we've got the Asian bush honeysuckle. And uh, overstory, we have the uh, ornamental pear. So we've got from ground to sky, all the invasive. Wow. <laughs> wow.